Hello, my name is Michael Parker. This is episode 34 of Antidote. And today we're going to talk about guns in America. Too many? Not enough. What does the Second Amendment actually say? And has that changed over time? Joining us in the studio to discuss this today is Adam Winkler. He is a professor of constitutional law at the UCLA School of Law. He's also the author of the book, Gunfight, the Battle Over the Right to Bear Arms in America. Welcome, Adam. Thanks for having me. We're pleased that you joined us today. I, uh, you know, the gun issue, always, always a hot button issue. And regardless of which side you fall on, there are people who are quite animated and vociferous about their point of view on this. But one of the things I wanted to start off with was literally as I'm getting in the car to come up here, I come across this article this happened, I guess, on Saturday in Chicago, because this is going to bear into some of the things we're going to talk about later. In Chicago on Saturday night, a person that was, I guess, going to hold up a bodega, bodega in, in Chicago, he had a toy gun, so he apparently knew the owner of this business. He was going to go in there, hold up the the business and then a, another person who was in the store in costume this was halloween night was brandishing a real gun and killed him shot him several times this is the type of story we don't hear as much of but what does this say to you if anything well, i think it's an important corrective to the popular understanding of guns so many people only see guns as a question of criminals that criminals use guns or they're used in accidents and someone gets hurt a small child who shouldn't be uh, playing with a gun shoots a friend or shoots himself um, but one of the reasons why so many people have guns in america is because they believe they're necessary for self-defense the idea they're going to protect their home they're going to protect their families or they're going to protect their neighbors uh, if, if it comes to that. Uh, and this incident was an incident where someone was using a firearm uh, to defend someone who was being threatened. Um, and I think it's, an important, it's important to realize that that's one of the reasons why so many people really feel strongly about guns. Because so long as someone has a gun because they think that they might not survive the night without one, no matter what laws you pass, that person's going to have that gun. And we need to recognize that there are legitimate reasons for people to have guns. Uh, and it's not just all criminals and accidents. I agree. In this particular case, this gentleman who had the gun, who did the shooting, they're saying that he's probably not going to be charged. He had a, he had a valid concealed carry license, and they don't think they're going to file charges against him. However, on the other side of it, the family of the man who is now deceased is saying, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, should he have been shot several times? So I would argue that at one point we have to accept a certain level of personal responsibility. If I go into a business brandishing even a false or a toy weapon, I'm kind of inviting a level of intensity into my life. And you know what? Uh, so, I mean, is there any kind of a case that can be made against this guy now that, that shot the person with the fake gun? Well, I wouldn't be surprised to see the family bring a civil suit against the shooter here. Um, I'd be surprised if they were to win such a case. Um, you know, look, if you go into a store and you've got a, what looks like a gun, it turns out it was a toy gun, but it didn't look like a toy gun from all accounts, um, and you threaten someone with that, you're asking for someone to defend themselves. Uh, and in this country and in all Western countries, you have a right to defend yourself if someone's threatening you. There's no reason why, I mean, we know now that it was a toy gun, but we didn't know at the time, and um, certainly no one would even think twice had the store owner taken out a gun and shot someone to protect themselves and to protect their business. You know, we have a right to defend uh, our neighbor as well, and I'd be surprised if prosecutors bring charges against the, the shooter in this case, and I'd be very surprised if, even though I wouldn't be surprised by a lawsuit against the shooter, be very surprised if he were held ultimately liable for any negligence or misconduct. Understood. Your book, Gunfight, if we can bring up that photo again, has been lauded by quite a few people as being just really well written and well reasoned. I'm very impressed with, with all the work that I've, I've seen of yours. And yes, we do have this right to bear arms. We're going to talk about the Second Amendment um, because I. When I've been watching some of the interviews that you've done, and, and I've heard this from other people as well, people want to argue what the Second Amendment actually says. So I'm going to read it to the audience 
quickly, and then I want you to walk us through this. The Second Amendment says this, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, some people have, have Criticize that, saying, well, right off the bat, we're talking about this idea of a militia, which in this day and age certainly seems obsolete. But tell us from a constitutional law point of view, what does the Second Amendment say, and has that meaning changed over 200 plus years? Well, it's a great question because I think part of the problem with the Second Amendment, to the extent there is one, is that it has an inherent ambiguity to it. James Madison, the author of the Second Amendment, put in all these commas, and it doesn't seem like the whole thing flows together smoothly. Um, and so it's really confused generations of Americans. I think the best way to understand the Second Amendment is that it protects, the, as the final clause of the Constitution suggests, uh, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, um, and that shall not be infringed. Now, if we understand, look at that particular part of the Second Amendment, we can see it as part of a line of individual rights amendments in the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment talks about the right of the people, too, uh, to petition government for redress of grievances, as well as protecting rights, individual rights of freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of the press. Um, the Fourth Amendment talks about the right of the people to be secure in their homes um, against unreasonable searches and seizures. Again, we think of that as an individual right, uh, an individual right of privacy. Same thing, we can go through a bunch of other, the Fifth Amendment uh, it also talks about uh, rights belonging to persons, um, and we interpret those things to be individual rights. I think it would be odd to think that the framers intended by the Second Amendment not to protect an individual right when the Bill of Rights was all about individual rights and every other provision in the Bill of Rights, uh, at least the first eight amendments, are all individual right provisions. So we should understand the Second Amendment to protect an individual right. But that still raises the question, is it only in the context of a well-regulated militia that you have this right? What the Supreme Court said, and I think the court got it right on this regard, is that the phrase well-regulated militia uh, being necessary to the security of a free state provides the reasoning, the primary reasoning why the framers put the Second Amendment in the Constitution. They believed in an armed citizenry, the militia. We think mm -hmm. of the militia as maybe the National Guard. That's not how the framers thought of it. The framers thought of it as a citizen's militia, right. where people would be called to serve, ordinary people, and they would go home, grab their guns, and be ready to fight in an instant. Hence the Minutemen yes. from revolutionary fame. Um, and so when the framers talked about the militia, they were just talking about the citizenry at large. They weren't just talking about a select group of specially trained people. Um, what the Supreme Court said is, yeah, the framers wanted to protect the militias, and that the way they did that was by guaranteeing an individual right to have guns for personal protection. I also think that when thinking about the Second Amendment, though, it's important not to get too focused on the founders mm -hmm. and what they thought in 1791. My view is that none of our constitutional rights should be cabined only to what the founders thought in 1791. It's not an acceptable way to interpret the First Amendment. It's not an acceptable way to interpret the Fourth Amendment. It shouldn't be an acceptable way to interpret the Second Amendment either. And if we think about how the Second Amendment has been interpreted and understood by generations of Americans, um, going back to the early 1800s, it was voiced to be an individual right, a right to have a gun for personal protection. And that the idea that it was limited to the militia, that only provided one of the reasons for the protection. But not this exclusive reason, and not the only reason. And certainly, since then, we've interpreted the Second Amendment much more broadly than just to apply in the militia context. Well, the 2008 uh, case, the Heller case, I mean, they, they upheld what you're saying. And one of the things I am a fan of about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights is it seems that there is this built-in elasticity to those documents in which or I would like to think that the forefathers uh, realize that, hey, listen, over time this is going to have to change and it will need to be adaptable. But I also understand where people do get a bit stickler about it and, and say, well, wait a minute, if they meant that, why did they not say that um, in more direct language? But that brings up the idea, you, you mentioned the Fourth Amendment and then the Fourteenth the Amendment as well kind of clarifies that. Talk about the Fourteenth Amendment in a, a little bit for us. Well, one of the things if we're talking about the Constitution's protection of the right to bear arms, we shouldn't just talk about the Second Amendment, we should also talk about the Fourteenth Amendment. The Fourteenth Amendment was added right after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. It was one of three 
amendments added after the Civil War to try to reconstruct our country. Um, and what the 14th Amendment says is no state shall deny to any person uh, effectively equal protection of the laws or due process of laws. Uh, and the framers of the 14th Amendment um, argued that the amendment was necessary to keep the southern states, even after they were brought back into the fold after the Civil War, from denying the rights of the freedmen. One of the rights that the freedmen were denied was the right to have guns. You know, in the South, blacks had never been able to own guns uh, before the Civil War. A lot of African Americans gained access to guns during the Civil War, either fighting for the Union Army, which had black units, and mm -hmm. the Union Army allowed people to keep their guns after they left the Army. Uh, and for blacks returning to the South, you took your gun with you. You knew mm -hmm. the kind of hostility that was waiting for you. And the southern states, in an effort to try to reestablish white supremacy, passed laws restricting the rights of African Americans, including laws requiring them to give up their guns. The KKK formed right after the Civil War to go out at night, terrorize black homes. One of the first things the KKK did was target gun owners among the black community. They wanted to get the guns out of the hands of African Americans mm -hmm. because Without guns, it was going to be a lot harder to fight back for African Americans. So the framers of the 14th Amendment said, we need an amendment that's going to protect the fundamental rights of the freedmen. And they said specifically, among other rights, the right of uh, the people to keep and bear arms for personal protection against marauders like the Klansmen. So mm -hmm. the, part of the intent and understanding of the 14th Amendment was to protect the right of the freedmen to have guns for personal protection. Understood. And then even beyond the, the, the Bill of Rights, we have, you mentioned, most states, I believe 43 of 50 states within their constitutions, there are provisions that protect gun ownership. Can you talk That's about right. that a little bit? For all of the debate over the meaning of the Second Amendment and its ambiguity, the right to bear arms has never relied exclusively on the Second Amendment for protection in American law. Um, as you said, 43 of the 50 states have provisions in their state constitutions that say clearly that there is a right of the people to keep and bear arms. And unlike the Second Amendment, which has only just recently been interpreted by the Supreme Court, these state constitutional provisions have cases interpreting them going all the way back to the 1820s. Mm -hmm. And what we find is that going all the way back, we find a pretty consistent pattern where courts have interpreted these provisions not to protect just some militia, but to protect an individual's right to have a gun for personal protection. And of course, it wouldn't make much sense in a state constitution to protect a right for the state to have a militia against federal interference. A state constitution can't control what the federal government does. One of the premises that you put forth in the book is that, because a lot of people think, oh, well, gun control, we need gun control. But in fact, gun control has been a historical part of our story of guns in America. Talk, to, talk about that, because I think a lot of people are not aware of that. They think that they picture just this Wild West environment for 200 some odd years. That's right, and we have this sort of image that uh, we have a right to bear arms and the Second Amendment means you can't have gun control. I think that's totally wrong. I think the Second Amendment puts some limits on gun control, to be sure. All our constitutional amendments do that. But the history of guns in America is not just a history of the Second Amendment and the six-shooter. Uh, it's a history also of efforts to balance public safety uh, with gun rights. And so the Founding Fathers had gun control. They barred people from having guns if they didn't trust them. Um, slaves most notably, but also mm -hmm. free blacks and even law-abiding white people who refused to swear an oath of loyalty to the Constitution. That is to say, political dissenters who didn't mm -hmm. like the idea of a revolution. They were subject to forcible disarmament. Uh, founders made gun owners show up at mandatory musters where their guns would be registered on public rolls because the country needed those guns in the event of war, and if you didn't show up to serve, your gun would be seized. If we go all the way through American history, we see the same pattern. The Wild West, considered maybe the heart of America's gun culture. Mm -hmm. You know, we have that image of the gunslinger sure. walking through town with the six shooters on John each John Wayne, high noon, man. John Wayne, high noon. But the truth is, is Wild West, frontier towns on the Wild West had the most restrictive gun control laws in the nation. Explain. Well, so if you went into a, a town like um, Dodge City, Kansas, or Tombstone, Arizona, they had restrictions on people's ability to carry guns in public. So everyone had guns in the Wild West. You know, if you're going from place to place out in the untamed wilderness, you had to worry about bandits, you had to worry about native tribes that wild might be animals. hostile, wild animals. You had a gun. You needed personal protection. Um, but when you came into a frontier town like Dodge City, uh, or Tombstone, Arizona, you had to check your gun with the marshal, uh, and you'd get a little token 
And you could use that token when you left the town to get your gun back. Uh, and in fact, Dodge City, Kansas, a famous gunslinger town, the very first law they passed in 1873 when they formed their municipal government, a gun control law banning the carrying of concealed weapons. And often these, sta often these towns broaden that, uh, those prohibitions to apply to openly carried weapons too. Okay, back up a little bit. So you said that if I go into a town like Dodge City, I go to see the sheriff, and he gives me a token, and you're saying that I hand him my gun and I don't get it until I leave? That's right. You hand in your gun, you don't get it until you leave. You get a little token. Uh, and in fact, you can look on the, on the internet, you can find some photographs. There is a, f a photograph of a gun that's, uh, that's uh, hanging in a bar up in, J in Alaska. I think it's Juneau, Alaska. Um, Wyatt Earp had been to Alaska um, at the, towards the end of the Wild West period, mm -hmm. and he had to check his gun with the sheriff when he mm -hmm. was there, and he had to leave in the middle of the night for some reason, uh, uncertain exactly why, but they still have the gun sure. in Juneau, Alaska, waiting for him. So if you find a little token, you might well be able to go get Wyatt Earp's gun if you get up to Alaska. I did not know that part. I mean, so what you're saying is, I mean, because people clamor every time there is another school shooting or a mass shooting, which is tragic, People clamor for more gun control. And, but the thing is, what does that mean? I mean, what are effective forms of gun control that could really change things? Because you mentioned there's 320 million guns in the United States. That's a lot of guns. And whenever, when I reached out to you, it was around the 9th or the 10th, and at that point, the burning headlines were that Barack Obama was going to use executive action to try to enact this thing, which had really been around since 2013, which was kind of changing the way we deal with people that sell guns. If you sold 50 or more, your, your, stat, uh, your stature was going to be changed to a dealer or something like that. But what, what are the types of gun control that would really work? Well, I think that we have to recognize with regards to the 320 million guns, any gun control law that you put on the books today is going to be burdened by those 320 million guns. Certainly. It makes it very hard to keep guns out of the hands of criminals when there's so many guns in mm -hmm. circulation already. But there are laws, I think, that we recognize can work, and every state has them, for instance. Uh, bans on people, uh, felons, for instance, from having guns. Um, we want to keep people who have a known history of dangerous behavior from lawfully getting a gun. Does that mean no criminal will ever get a gun? If only it did. Right. But we want to make it harder for them to get guns. Um, so things like background checks uh, can also help too, right? To solidify the idea that you can't just go to a gun store and buy a gun. Um, we could have effective laws, more effective laws on gun trafficking. You know, California is a place that has very restrictive gun control laws. Yes. And gun owners are always chafing at California's very restrictive gun control laws. But there are some uh, benefits to society that happen at least because of these laws, um, which is that if you you ask, for instance, um, agents of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms who to handle the major federal law enforcement agency, they say they find almost no uh, guns uh, at crime scenes outside of California that come from California. So the guns are not being exported from California to support criminal activity elsewhere. You can't say that about Virginia. We know that a lot of Virginia's guns show up in New York City in crime scenes because you can't buy a gun really easily in New York City. You got to have a whole permitting process. And if you have these laws that can make it more difficult for a criminal to get their hands on guns, you can really move the ball forward in reducing the number of these guns that show up uh, at crime scenes. But I also think that it's important to recognize some forms of gun control are really un ineffective and we shouldn't be pursuing them. I think the gun control movement today is very high on the idea of banning assault weapons. That is a bad idea. Glad you brought that up. Explain why that is. That is not, they're not a good law. So this is like the equivalent This surprised of, me, by the way, how this right. works. Well, this is kind of like the equivalent of a law that's designed to reduce dog bites by outlawing Doberman pinchers with clipped ears. And you say, what? Well, here's how they assault. So you have assault weapons are just type of, a type of rifle. Right. And they apply to rifles that have certain characteristics, including things like military style characteristics like a bayonet lug or a folding buttstock or a flash suppressor at the end. Mm -hmm. But the gun makers can sell the exact same gun with the exact same lethality 
as long as it doesn't have the bayonet lug or the folding buttstock or the flash suppressor. Just remove those modifications. And you sell the same gun. And let's face it, the bayonet lug is not the thing that makes the firearm really dangerous. We don't have a lot of bayonettings, I don't right. think, in, in America. Um, so uh, what you've done is you've basically just eliminated guns that have certain mostly cosmetic features and allowed guns that are just as dangerous to be circulated and sold at will. So, uh, like I say, it's like saying uh, we want to reduce dog bites and we're going to say you can't have a Doberman Pinscher with clipped ears. But mm -hmm. you can have a Doberman Pinscher that doesn't have clipped ears and you could have any other kind of dog too. You can't really expect that to really reduce dog bites. That's right. And But the name, and here again a lot of times when they introduce these measures they always have some type of slightly deceptive name. And when you talk about a ban on assault weapons, well, that sounds on its face like, hey, well, that might be reasonable. Um, but as you mentioned, there are loopholes, and those who actually know guns are some of the first ones to point out, like, this is worthless. And, you know, rifles are just very rarely used in criminal activity. Um, I think there's about uh, 12 to 13,000 people who are killed uh, from criminal misuse of guns every year, and only 300 killed by rifles, all rifles, assault rifles, non-assault rifles, deer hunting rifles, all sorts of rifles. Um, so it's a relatively small number compared to the total, right? Mm -hmm. the, most people are dying at the hands of handguns, yes. people wielding handguns, not these assault weapons. But this has become a real big issue in the gun control movement. They think this is really the answer to eliminate these guns that are uh, admittedly scary looking, they're sure. military looking, uh, you know, they, I could see people saying there's no reason why someone should have that type of gun, but then they'll say, well, it's okay for someone to have another gun, like a gun that's good for deer hunting, that's much more powerful and shoots mm -hmm. a larger round and is going to do a lot more damage to someone. So I think it's important for gun control advocates to have a better sense of what's going to work and what's not going to work and propose laws that are more likely to work than not. Well, what you're saying right there is also, listen, if you're a gun control advocate, then you need to know a lot about guns. You need to have a practical knowledge of guns because they've embarrassed themselves on some of these, these laws. And in another interview you did, you meant, there was a mention of, I believe, a New York law where they were trying to ban these particular magazines in which the, the magazine had seven bullets or more. But the point was that most magazines have 10, so you were in some way banning all magazines, which is ridiculous because it demonstrated that the people who crafted this piece of legislation didn't really know anything about guns. And I think it is a big problem with the gun debate Hurts today. the credibility. Hurts credibility. I can't tell you how many times I've been out there and I'll say, well, we shouldn't ban assault weapons. It's not an effective good gun control policy. People say, well, we should ban these weapons because there's no reason why someone should have a machine gun on the street today. But assault weapons are not machine guns. Um, a machine guns are a, fi a firearm where you pull the trigger once and it continuously fires mm -hmm. until you let go of the trigger. That's not what these assault weapons do. Um, we've banned the sale of machine guns in America uh, now for uh, almost 30 years, uh, and uh, that's not what these guns are. And if you don't know what the guns are, your gun control laws are not going to be very effective. But the thing is, I think the people in the gun control community who are leaders of the community, they understand what the, they understand guns. Like this is what their life is. Um, I would think that I would hope that they would be uh, uh, more sensitive to uh, an issue that's a uh, type of weapon that's really not going to uh, reduce crime if you ban it. The gun control issue, uh, so often it just seems like you're playing to emotions, and, and that could be said on both sides, but the truth of the matter, when we talk again about this 320 million guns, and these atrocities that are committed in schoolyards or these mass killings, a lot of times those people who perpetrated those heinous acts had those guns in a legal sense already, and I, I don't know, it's just, to me, I don't understand how people think that, oh yeah, well, you know, we're just going to live in this rainbow unicorn world because we're going to take all the guns away and it's just, it's completely unrealistic. And then we have the other side of the issue, which doesn't get as much uh, play in the press of this issue like we brought up today where, listen, I'm not saying that everybody wants to be Batman or needs to be a, you know, out there, uh, you know, being a uh, vigilante, but we do have the right to bear arms, and we do have the right to protect our families and our homes and uh, the things within them. Norway, here's a country that has very strict gun laws, and it didn't stop that guy, and he killed 70-some-odd people. 
Um, the worst shooting in mass shooting in human history yes. in a country that had very restrictive gun control laws. But I think what's important, and see, I think the mass shootings, they get all our focus. Right. Right. That's what drives the headlines. That's what it drives the gun debate. Uh, my phone rings off the hook. I'm my sure. emails come in whenever there's a mass shooting. But what we fail to forget is that, you know, maybe nine people died in that mass shooting up in Oregon Community College. But since that date, we have about 40 people dying every day from criminal misuse of guns, day in, day out, day in, day out. They don't get, those victims don't get the, the headlines that the mass shooters do. I think what we should be doing is not focusing our gun control efforts with an uh, eye towards stopping mass shooters. Love to do that, but I think it's next to impossible to do. As long as you have guns, someone who really wants to do something crazy and kill a lot of people will sure. have the means and probably the opportunity to Certainly. do so. But what we can do is make it harder uh, for criminals to get their hands on guns as a matter of daily course and try to reduce the daily death toll from guns. So we're still going to have some mass shootings probably, unfortunately, but we can maybe take the 40 who are dying every day from criminal misuse of gun. Let's get that down to 35. Let's get that down to 30. Let's get that down to 25. Let's make headway in a slow, steady progress by making it harder to, for criminals to get their hands on guns, to crack down on gun trafficking, have better background checks, um, and, and do everything we can to try to lower that number. I think that's an, a more achievable goal than to eliminate mass shootings. I agree, and one of the things that you discuss is treating the whole gun issue as more of a public health crisis. and. It's interesting because, and people always, you know, oh, you know, guns don't kill people, people kill people, or what have you, but the public health a aspect of it is interesting to me, and, but on the other hand, this idea of prohibiting something, prohibition, the war on drugs, both of them have not really seemed to work very well, and to prohibit guns just means that people will go to countries, man, let's just go over the border to Mexico. I bet I could get some guns. It's, people will find a way to get the things that they want. And your approach of treating it as a public health aspect and treating it on an incremental level makes sense to me. Um, but it does mean what we gotta have is we gotta have better research into gun violence prevention. And part of the problem is, is that many people in the gun community hate the idea of this being treated as a public health problem. Uh, and because that means it's something that, that we need to actually reduce access to guns. That's what they interpret that to mean. I think what it really means is that what we need to do is free up federal money to do research on gun violence prevention. Let's mm -hmm. figure out what kinds of laws work, what kinds of laws don't work. Part of the reason why we don't really know with great effectiveness which laws are super, are, well, we don't really know which laws are super effective and which ones are not super effective, uh, it's largely because there's very little research being done um, on gun issues. Uh, there's very little money. The, uh, the Center for Disease Control, which um, has uh, funds a ton of academic research into public health problems in America, has been barred from supporting any research that's going to lead to gun control efforts. Um, and hmm. so what we've done is we don't have a lot of research into a problem that, that leads to 30,000 people um, dying every day, uh, sorry, every year uh, in America, both from suicides and homicides. And we should be doing more to try to free up that money so to figure out what works and what doesn't work. I think if we did that kind of research, we'd find that bans on assault weapons don't work. And we'd find that things like universal background checks requiring every single gun transaction to, be, to go through a background check, that does work. That mm -hmm. makes it a lot harder for criminals to get their hands on guns. This brings us back to the federal version versus the state because, yes, California, we have stringent laws, but Arizona, Nevada, they don't. So if there is, a, are you proposing then that future gun laws, if they exist, should be at the federal level? And in, if so, in what, what form? Well, I think that, you know, we have a federalist system, we have state laws, we have federal laws, that's how we handle a lot of problems. I think to the most effective gun control laws are going to be federal gun control laws, mm -hmm. because as you say, when Arizona's got easy laws, making it easy access to, to gun laws, and California has restrictive laws, people will go to Arizona uh, and, and get their guns if they can. 
Um, might not be lawful, uh, but people will do it because it's easy. Sure. Um, the best way to have it is to have a uniform system. It's like what we've done for machine guns. We don't allow states to enact their own rules uh, on machine guns, uh, at least that are contrary to the federal rules. And the federal rules are you need to have, uh, if you want to have a machine gun, you've got to go through an extensive licensing process. You cannot buy a new one. They won't sell you a new machine gun. There's some couple hundred thousand that are grandfathered in from before the ban in 1986. Um, but the most effective gun control laws are going to be at the federal level. I will say that federal laws are stymied right now. We're not likely to see any federal laws in the near future. And that's led to the gun control movement really pushing uh, on state legislatures mm -hmm. to do something to fill the gaps a, in a piecemeal basis uh, at the state level. I don't think that's nearly as effective, but, uh, but that's, you could at least do something to move the ball forward at the state level when the federal laws are not forthcoming. And when we talk about the federal law, then we have to talk about the NRA. Because the NRA, everybody knows, extremely powerful political organization. What I did not know is how the NRA began, and they were, they were somewhat pro-gun control in the beginning. Talk about the NRA and its origins. Well, the NRA has really evolved a lot, and the NRA began um, uh, as an organization that was designed to help soldiers um, be well-trained, citizen soldiers to be well-trained. Um, and in its early years, the NRA was really at the forefront of the gun control movement, not the gun rights movement. In the 1920s and the 1930s, the NRA was uh, actively helping states pass laws, making it harder for people to carry guns in public, licensing laws, restrictions on who could carry guns in public. Uh, and in fact, when Congress was considering the first major federal gun control law, the National Firearms Act of 1934, um, the NRA's president, Carl Frederick, was asked to testify before Congress. And he was uh, asked if the Second Amendment imposed any limitations on what Congress could do in passing a gun control law. And his answer from the perspective of today is, is quite amazing. He said, I have never given it any study from that point of view. And elsewhere, Carl Frederick, the president of the NRA, wrote that protection for guns comes not from the Constitution, but from wise public policy. Uh, that enlightened people will see that a, a person, especially in a rural area, needs to have a gun for personal protection. Police aren't going to be there to protect them, and that we should have that policy. But the NRA really supported gun control up until the 1970s, and really the NRA changed literally overnight. What happened? Well. Uh, in the early 1970s, the leadership of the NRA um, was um, favorable to gun control. It wasn't favorable to any gun control, but they were gun control advocates, and they supported the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968, um, which passed new federal restrictions on who could have guns and gun licensing. Um, and the leadership of the NRA hatched a plan to move the NRA's headquarters uh, out of uh, Washington, D.C. and move it to Colorado Springs. And they would refocus on outdoors activities, uh, environmentalism, hunting, and retreat from political activity. Well, this angered a group of hardliners in the mm -hmm. membership um, who really thought that guns were about shooting criminals, not shooting ducks. Yes. Uh, and uh, it was a time of rising crime rates, not surprising that people f thought that guns would be helpful in, in defending themselves. Um, and the hardliners organized a secret uh, conspiracy, if you will. Not, nothing illegal, but a secret conspiracy. They, they had an agreement where they were going to go to the NRA's annual meeting of the membership. They manipulated the rules of order for the, uh, for the organization uh, and um, orchestrated a plan where they kicked out the entire leadership of the NRA and replace them um, with their own hardline leaders who are committed to a no compromises approach to the Second Amendment. So uh, it literally, the NRA changed overnight. One day it was pro-gun control, the next day it was a hardline, no compromises, anti-gun control organization. Okay, but the members of the NRA at that time when that happened, was there any outrage or was everybody like, hey, we're cool with that? I mean, I, what was the response to that within NRA membership? I think there was a mixed response, but it was clear, I think, from the perspective of history that the hardliners who took over the NRA were the ones who were building on the growing uh, sort of ideological shift of the members uh, and that they were more in tune with where the members were going than the old leadership. As we've seen, the NRA has become a much stronger organization since 1977. It's become maybe, uh, people say it's the most powerful political lobbying group in Washington. Whether that's true or not, that's still a pretty good 
still to be good to be considered one of the Certainly. Uh, most powerful. Um, and the NRA has since then become a, a really important political player, and it's got a growing membership. And uh, whenever there's another gun control law proposed, their membership spikes again. So, so clearly the hardliners were onto something uh, when they viewed the NRA's mission as being about political activism uh, to fight gun control. Well, the NRA, th this rise of this new wave of NRA helped usher in Reagan and all of that in the 80s and still today is very powerful, as you mentioned. And the thing with the NRA is, is that the gun issue gets people to polls. Straight up, man. I mean, listen, I grew up in Texas. I've mentioned that on the show before. I grew up in that rural area that you're talking about where my family and everyone I know was very positive to guns and everyone had guns for sport and for protection. And they feel very strongly about that even to this day. And there are many within, and this is obvious to everyone that's paying attention, that many of those people within the Republican Party, they are loath to have to go against the NRA in any way because the NRA gets people to vote. Right, and people often, I think, mistakenly view the NRA's power as coming just from the fact that it's got a lot of money um, and that it buys off politicians. I don't think that's right. I think you point out really what the heart of the NRA's power is, which is the ability to turn out voters on election day. It's huge. And in a democracy, that's the greatest power you can have. And it's why the NRA gets respect from a lot of lawmakers, because there's a lot of single issue pro-gun voters. Uh, I'll tell you a story. After, after Newtown, President Obama proposed universal background checks. Polling was off the charts in favor of universal background checks. 90% of the people polled said, I support uh, universal background checks. More than 85% of gun owners said, I support universal background checks. The law didn't get passed. Why? Well, uh, Heidi Heitkamp, a Democratic senator from a purple state uh, uh, of South Dakota, uh, she said that the calls to her office, the constituents who were so politically active they were going to pick up the phone and call her, ran seven to one against universal background checks. So Heidi Heitkamp looks at a poll and says, well, nine out of 10 support universal background checks. But when you look at the politically active people in my state, it's seven to one the other way. Well, which way is she going to go? Uh, you can't be shocked. You could criticize her for not doing what she thinks is best for her community, uh, if you think that the gun control law was best for her community. But you can't really be surprised that a politician is going to say, hey, look, my, my constituents are speaking. And I think what that says is that there's a lot of intensity on the pro-gun side. Absolutely. Support for gun control is very broad, but it's not very deep. Um, support for strong gun rights is very deep, and those are people who are much more politically engaged. They give to, to candidates, they organize their friends, they make phone calls to elected officials, and on election day, they say, I'm gonna vote based on the gun issue only. There's not a lot of people in the gun control side who do those things. That is absolutely true, and I mean, I, it is a very powerful, polarizing message the people that want to own their guns, and I have a lot of friends who own guns, and, and, and listen, you know what? I don't really have an interest in guns, but I have a very big interest in the right to own them. And I think that's critical to the continuation of an American system as we originally envisioned it. Now, to, I also understand, on the other hand, the people that get very emotional after these events where they say, well, you know, if we wouldn't have had these guns, you know, then this thing would have happened. But it's just, it just doesn't follow in a practical sense that we could remove these guns. I mean, it's just, it, it just doesn't work. I don't see how, how you do it. And um, even gun control itself, there, people are always going to get around it. You mentioned that gun makers are going to find the loopholes. They're going to make the gun in a different way. And we're entering into an era where it's all, uh, maybe all bets are off, when we have 3D printed guns that people could make at home. That's only a matter of time uh, before that technology is there. I mean, it's already there to build yes. some guns. Um, whether you know those guns are particularly reliable right now, not really, but it's only a matter of time before that happens. Look, the guns are here to stay, and I think the essential for all sides in the gun debate to move forward and to get out of sort of the rut that we're in is at least one thing, to recognize the permanence of guns in America. Amen, brother. They're here to stay. There's too many of them, uh, uh, them for us to ever get rid of them, even if you wanted to. Um, you know, we tried to ban small, easy-to-conceal things that people are passionate about, drugs, alcohol. 
It just doesn't work, and uh, banning guns is not going to work either. You're just going to feed the black market. You go on, some of the fun uh, things I've had is you can go on to Amazon. Uh, when I was researching my book, I went on to Amazon to look at uh, what, was, what kind of books were out there for gun owners. And one of these is a lot of books out there about how to hide your guns for when the government comes to take them away. Uh, and I think it was just a sign, you know, a lot of people just feel very passionately about this. You're not going to get rid of the guns. What we should be doing is trying to figure out what kinds of laws can we put in place to reduce the death toll from the guns that are here. We have drinking, we have driving. What we've done is come up with policies to try to reduce drunk driving and reduce the death toll from those two activities. That's why it's a public health problem. That's the way we should approach it rather than trying to confiscate guns or get rid of them. I agree with you, and I'm glad you brought up that one point. In our, in our last few moments, we do have to address this one thing about, yes, there's the idea that a lot of gun owners feel that one day, you know, the government is going to come for my guns. And it is back to that Second Amendment that those people of that time, they wanted to be able to own guns in case of a tyrannical government gone out of reach, and they wanted to be able to defend themselves. So. That question is, you know, we haven't talked a lot about that today and we're running out of time, but there is that on a lot of people's minds as well. And a lot of people will say, well, wait a minute, that's just crazy. The government's not going to come for your guns. You're not going to have to fight back against some, you know, new version of a totalitarian system. But I don't know. That's that's part of it. And that's part of that's just one more reason people are so adamant about the right to own and bear arms. And I do think that one of the sort of essential keys to getting out of the rut that the gun debate is currently stuck in is long-term acceptance of the Supreme Court's ruling in the Heller case. That was that 2008. Mentioned. 2008 that you mentioned. Uh, I, the court said that there is an individual right to bear arms, but they didn't endorse a, a libertarian, anyone can have any gun anywhere you want at any time. Uh, it was uh, a more reasonable right. It was a right to recognize you individuals have a right to have guns to protect themselves in their homes. Um, but government also has a right to pass law. It has the authority, the legitimate authority, to pass laws to try to reduce gun violence. Um, and I think, you know, to the extent that becomes more ingrained in our uh, our social fabric, as progressives start to accept that principle, um, I think there's a lot of gun owners who support better gun control laws. I agree with you. And the reason why they don't support better gun control laws is because they're afraid if I support this gun control law, the government is going to come get my guns one day. The Heller case tells us the government can never come take your guns. And what we need to have is that decision accepted over time. And in 20 or 30 years, when it's really part of the fabric of our Constitution, um, I think we'll actually be in a much better place to adopt gun control laws than we are today. Adam Winkler has been our guest today. His book, Gunfight, is great. I urge you to go out and get it. Thank you for coming on the show today. I mean, everything you've said today makes a lot of sense to me. And we talked about, before we came on the show, you and I have not similar backgrounds, but we've kind of come to the same place on the whole gun thing. Like I say, I'm, I'm not really interested in guns per se, but I am interested in the right to own them for those who have them in a responsible fashion. So thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, that has been episode 34. Join us next week. We are going to have an update on the Westlake uh, radiation, radiated dump outside of St. Louis. My friend Byron DeLear is going to be joining us. He has some brand new research that has not been heard yet regarding that. So that's going to be next week. Until, uh, until then, you, me, every single one of us, we are what makes the antidote.